Hey, this is Dr. M with another supplemental video for the Spring 2015 Genetics Lecture Course. And this one's going to cover epistasis. So I'm going to start out with gene interactions. And the thing about gene interactions is that a single trait, in this case color of peppers, bell peppers, is affected by two genes, not just one gene, but two genes, which means that um, this is an example of a gene interaction, but this is not epistasis. Epistasis is a special case of gene interactions where the genotype at one locus masks the phenotypic effects of another locus. So, um, for in this case, we have gene interactions that involve a single trait, bell pepper color, two loci, we'll call it the Y locus and the C locus, such that when you have dominant wild type alleles at both loci, you have a red bell pepper. Um, and if you have a single dominant Y allele at one locus and the uh, recessive homozygous genotype at the other locus, you'll end up with one color, in this case peach. And if you have a homozygous recessive at the Y locus but a dominant allele at the C locus, you end up with orange. And if you have homozygous recessive at both loci, you're cream. Okay, so this is an example of a gene interaction because there are two genes that are required to um, create the coloration pattern. This is not epistasis because epistasis is a special case of gene interactions where the genotype of one locus masks the phenotypic effect of the other locus. And so let's look at those more, more closely. There are a number of types of epistasis. You can have recessive epistasis, where it is the recessive allele that masks the effect of the other locus. In this case, if you have a, um, a homozygous recessive genotype at the E locus, then you mask any effect of genotype at the B locus. And no matter what the genotype is here, you end up with yellow coloration or the yellow lab. If you have a dominant allele at the E locus that allows the, um, the phenotype at the B locus to be expressed. And so if you have a dominant allele at the B locus, you're going to have a black lab. And if you have recessive homozygous uh, genotype at the B locus, you're going to have a chocolate lab. So the molecular mechanism for this pattern is that the E locus determines whether you see pigment at the B locus. So another way of thinking about this is that the E locus tells you whether or not you have pigment, and the B locus says, well, if I do have pigment, then it is black or brown, okay? So that is recessive epistasis. Another example of recessive epistasis is when you have um, a, an H locus that encodes a precursor for antigens at the, um, at the ABO um, blood type gene. So if you have a dominant allele at the H locus, you are allowed to express your ABO genotype at that locus. If, however, you are homozygous recessive, then you will not be able to express any antigens regardless of what your genotype is at the ABO locus, and you will automatically be in type O. So even if you're genotypically AB, you will uh, you will manifest your phenotype as type O because you have a uh, recessive homozygous genotype at the H locus, and this is called the Bombay phenotype. 
Now in both this case, the blood type um, example and the lab color example, you have a two-step process where the, the expression of the second locus, in this case the ABO um, blood type, depends on the genotype of the first locus. And this is why this is recessive epistasis because it's the recessive um, allele in the homozygous uh, form that masks expression of these other um, of the the, the other uh, gene. All right. Now we also have dominant epistasis, and in dominant epistasis, um, you have it's the dominant allele that is going to mask expression at the second locus. So in this case, we have color of summer squashes. And if you are homozygous dominant, you are going to um, be masking, or if you're homozygous dominant um, at the W locus, you're going to mask the effect of coloration at the, at the Y locus. So this is similar to the lab example because um, it is the expression of, um, it's the genotype of the W locus that is influencing expression of the Y locus. And so if you are dominant, you have a dominant allele, the W locus, it doesn't really matter um, what your Y locus genotype is. You're automatically going to be white. However, if you're recessive um, homozygous at, um, my cursor keeps disappearing, if you're recessive homozygous at the W locus, then you're allowed to, um, to express your big Y or your little Y, depending on what you have, what your genotype is. So in the case of recessive epistasis, we are, um, our H locus, what's masking, the ABO locus is directly producing the compound that the ABO, ABO locus needs. And if it doesn't produce it, the ABO locus can't express its genotype. In the case of dominant epistasis, the W locus isn't producing any kind of a precursor to the Y locus. It's not producing some pigment precursor. It's actually producing a, um, a, G, a protein that that um, inhibits expression of at the Y locus, and so the nature of recessive epistasis is has to do with positive regulation. So when this is dominant, we are good to go, and we can um, express our ABO phenotype. In the case of dominant epistasis, if our protein product is produced by the dominant allele, then we experience negative regulation of the Y locus, such that if, if W present, if the W protein is present, <coughs> it inhibits expression of the Y locus no matter what the genotype is at the Y locus. Okay, so that's, so just again, recessive epistasis is indicative of positive regulation, a, a positive um, regulatory relationship between the two genes. And dominant epistasis is indicative of a negative regulatory relationship between the two, two genes, where in this case, W is inhibiting expression of Y. Okay, we can have it go both ways, where <coughs> expression of an allele or a genotype at either locus, it doesn't matter which one, masks the effect of, of the other locus. So for example, here we have albinism in snail shells um, can be caused by either recessive homozygosity at the B locus or homozygous recessivity at the A locus. In either case, you get albino snails. In, um, when you cross them, you get a, a wild type 
phenotype because now we've broken up the, the, that um, homozygous recessivity at both loci to produce a, um, a heterozygote. So again, it doesn't really matter if either of these um, alleles or either of these loci are recessive homozygous, either the A or the B, it masks the effect of the other one. So it's reciprocal um, in effect. And this is indicative of, it may be indicative of two independent pathways that can influence um, albinism. And so this is actually reminiscent of complementation, which this is not a connection I made in lecture. Um, it was actually pointed out to me by an observant student of your, of a classmate of yours, um, that this is actually very much like complementation, where here we would have big B, big B, oh sorry, let's say down here, we'll ignore this one. Here we have what amounts to big B, big B, little a, little a. And here we have big A, big A, little B, B, little B, little B. And when we cross them, we get the wild type phenotype because now we're a dihybrid, we're heterozygous at both loci, which is basically what's happening here. Okay. So um, duplicate recessive epistasis. And you had a, um, a worksheet problem that talked about duplicate dominant epistasis and asked to explain what that was. And specifically asked to explain what the molecular mechanism would be, what, what would be a molecular pathway that could explain duplicate dominant epistasis. And the approach that um, would have been appropriate is to think about it in terms of, of this type of a pathway. So in this case, because, I mean, this is expressed in terms of a pathway, but you can also think about it in terms of having two independent pathways, such that you have enzyme one that can produce compound C, or you can have enzyme two that could produce compound C. And if one of these is not being made, then, then you end up with um, a, a, uh, an albino snail shell color.